Rosie, if you don't mind starting, when did you first start your channel and what are the basic things that you cover with your videos? So I, char I, I charted my channel. I started my channel in 2006. Um, it's youtube.com slash Rosianna. And because I started when I was 14 years old, um, it has covered my progression from like A-levels to university. And it has become in part like an advice channel, kind of a little bit of a big sister channel. Um, but I also talk a lot about books and I talk about, I do like cooking videos as well. It's a whole range of things. Um, and Charlie, you're going to represent Jack's Gap for us. I am. I am a little bit different to everyone sat on this table because I don't have my own channel, but I help produce other YouTube channels. So it's ranged over the last year and a half from working with people at Jack's Gap uh, and doing philanthropic kind of beautiful films, and then also just recently uh, with people like Casper Lee and doing a bit of light-hearted comedy and also sorted food. Um, we had sorted food on our panel last year, which was um, delicious. Uh, it's, um, I think it's kind of famous that Jack's Gap started during Jack's, or they're both gap year. Um, that was, what year was that? Um, that was just over three and a half years ago. Oh. And from there, it's blossomed into a wonderful passion project um, and a business, <laughs> which I don't think any of us really expected. Yeah. Um, so, Charlie, what about you? So, I'm Charlie McDonald. My YouTube channel is just youtube.com forward slash Charlie. Um, my timeline is pretty similar to Rosie's, really. I started making videos in about, at about 2007, just sort of as, as a hobby, really. Just, um, I didn't really have any particular direction at all when I started, and uh, nobody was making money from YouTube at all, either. So, I was really just doing it for fun, uh, just talking to the camera about whatever I felt like. Nowadays, I do some, like, short film stuff, narrative content, um, but also just kind of talking to my camera about my life. Um, and Adam, yours is a different channel as well in that you've got a very focus, obviously, on football. Yeah, um, oh, that was loud. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm a little bit different from these guys in that I work for an uh, online uh, video production company, and about two or three years ago, um, I didn't want to work on cute animal videos anymore. I wanted to make football videos, so I suggested that to these guys. So I've been going for a while now, sort of creating short form content around football. And yeah, it's going pretty well. And Esther? Hi, um, I'm Estee, and I have uh, beauty and fashion, and I'm trying to broaden it, broaden it into a more of a lifestyle channel as well. I started when I moved to the UK almost four years ago, and I started it as a hobby as well, and like Charlie, I didn't know that people were making a living off of this, so it really was a hobby. And yeah, it's just kind of gone from there. Um, so when did you personally first realize it could be a full-time job for you? I, I actually have a blog as well, and I remember going to beauty events back in the day and people talking about ads and things that they had on their websites, and I was like, I don't have any ads on here. How are people making money? What am I missing here? So that's kind of when it started, probably a year or two into it, and then it kind of, I realized the same thing about YouTube, yeah. And Charlie, when did you first think, this is gonna be my full-time job and not just a hobby? It was really, I was just making videos for long enough that eventually I was getting enough people watching me and I was earning enough money that I was like, oh, this is enough money that I can finally move out of my mom's house. But before that, it was really just like uh, when, I, when YouTube first introduced the partnership program, which is kind of a, a moot thing now. Anybody can really put ads on their, yeah. on their videos if they own the content. Um, people were making just like a little bit amount of money from it, just enough that it was all, like the equivalent of just like having a summer job or something. Yeah. But it was really like I started having YouTube as my full-time job when the other people were first <laughs> starting to do that, I guess, just when it became viable. Um, just sort of out of curiosity, what did your parents think about it, or did your mom even know that you were busy carving a career for yourself when she thought you were just <laughs> goofing off in your room? So, so I was about 16 when I started, so my mom just kind of like heard me up in my bedroom talking to myself. Um, I was, I think, pretty worried about what I was doing initially, for sure. Um, but I have a very supportive, I have very supportive parents and so um, she saw that it was something that was making me happy and then I kind of like came to her once I had a bit of momentum on my channel as well so I could be like, mom, I'm doing this weird thing but it's going well, so um, she, yeah, she's always been very supportive and now my mom is kind of like even more into the YouTube community than, than I am. She makes her own videos and stuff, so. 
Um, I actually think it's quite interesting. A lot of YouTubers, their family pops up. Their dad will pop up. Some of them have started. They're on Twitter. They've got zillions of followers. It's crazy. Um, just to get back to an earlier question we had with Jen. So, Rosie, I will start with you, but walk down. Audience or fan base or community, how, what do you call your subscribers in terms of if some, you have to say, call them something? Um, definitely community. I think that's the strongest because I don't just kind of put something out there and just kind of let it be out there. I read their comments, I go to their channels, and I'm really invested in their lives as well, um, which I think does give it more of a community feel. Charlie? Um, I think we have tended to float towards the term viewers just recently, particularly with Jack's Gap. Um, they're obviously two very good-looking, talented boys, uh, so it would be very easy to class anyone that watched their videos as fans or a fandom and a fangirl. Um, but they're, just because they're young and they're predominantly a female audience, it doesn't make them stupid. Uh, they're usually quite an intelligent audience, and I think that perhaps it might be a little bit degrading to class such a, a wide array of people as a fan base um, instead of a viewership or an audience or a community. And I think that sums it up a lot nicer and neater than just addressing people as fans. Um, Charlie, what do you call your subscribers? Um, I don't have a collective noun for them at all, for sure. Um, I think how, it's... How can you hashtag that? Say what? How can you have a... How, if you don't have a name for them, how can you hashtag it? <laughs> Um, well, when I make my videos, I try and stay very aware of the fact that the people who are watching it aren't watching it as like a community or an audience. The way you consume YouTube is very much just like one person in front of a computer. Like that's it the majority of the time. Even if you're like actively sharing a video with people around you, crowded around compu a computer, your first experience is still just been watching that video on its own. So it's more like one way. It feels more like radio to me, the way that that sort of relationship works. So when I'm making my videos, I don't say, hey, Charlie-isms or, and, you know, hey, guys, or anything like that. It's very much, hello, you individual person who's watching this video. I think the, for a lot of YouTube creators, the, the term fan feels a bit dirty. It feels like you're kind of, like, treating your audiences lesser than you, and you don't want to have that relationship with the people watching you at all. You want to be on, on their same level. Now, Adam, yours is a little bit, like, like news. I mean, about football, obviously. Mm. Fan, audience, how would you describe your um, viewers? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's definitely a community on our channel because it's all about debate and interaction. So we sort of put the debate out there, you know, who's better, Messi or Ronaldo? And you'll get thousands of comments of, you know, people who want to get their opinion across. So I think uh, a lot of our audience, they, they, they have something to say. So I think that's what makes it a community, more of a, an active thing. Great. Yeah, I completely I think fan is such a dirty word, you know, it makes me, it just like stings my heart whenever I, I would never say it, but if someone says it, it's just a bit, it just doesn't seem quite right, you know, it is a community, it's, I think viewer is fine because they're obviously viewing the video, but it is a community and we are all on the same page and that's what's so great about YouTube is because I don't feel like I'm up here and my viewers are, you know, it's all the same, we're all just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Also, jumping on the collective noun point, there are a couple yeah. of people who do it really well, like Wheezy Waiter, fantastic YouTuber, calls all his audience beard lovers, and it's such a term of endearment. It's coming from a really good, genuine, authentic place. It's not coming from a place of you all watch me pee people down there. It's yeah. So you like you can make those collective nouns, as it were. You can make them work. Yeah. Um, a few of you have mentioned already listening to them, you read all the comments, etc. Let's just do a quick show of hands in terms of what other platforms do you use actively. So, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and get in relationship to, to your main video blog, um, Instagram, Snapchat. Um, LinkedIn. <laughs> um, I invited LinkedIn to be one of our guests, and I'm kind of glad they didn't come. Um, now, just, just for comparison's sake, to the audience, how many of you are on LinkedIn? <laughs> how many of you are on Tumblr? Have a Tumblr blog? Oh, not too bad. Or better than I thought, maybe. Um, what 
what's the sort of the main channel besides YouTube itself that you're getting comments that you're actively listening and responding to, would you say? And maybe we'll start on the other end this time. I always say Twitter is my favorite. I'm actually addicted to it. It's, it's such a quick and easy way to connect with someone. And when they get a tweet from you or something, they really feel a bond with you and that, hey, this is kind of like my friend talking to me. You know, I think it's so nice to talk on Twitter. By far my favorite. Uh, yeah, I'd say Twitter as well. I think um, Facebook is a bit more um, passive in that people just sort of watch your content on there or maybe click through, but definitely Twitter you throw other questions out there and sort of get, get the feedback and stuff like that. Twitter, again, it feels like the place where you can have kind of like, you're able to have like a longer conversation with an individual if you want to. It doesn't feel as much like a kind of community type thing, I think. It's just, yeah, it's just, I just find people on Twitter are just a bit nicer as well, generally. So I want to talk to them. I'd have to, again, agree with Twitter. Um, it's been such a fantastic time. I hope Ellen's still here. But, but uh, just recently, we set up a blog. And on that, we formatted a forum. So it gave us a fantastic opportunity to open up questions about our content and our videos and say, is this what you like? Is there anything you'd like to see more of? And it, it opened a new kind of social media for us, personally, to gain such an interesting response. Yeah, great. I can be controversial. Tumblr, for me, is the big one. Um, I don't know who came first in terms of whether the people watching my videos were there or they just that's how they found my, my content, but that's what's worked best for me. We have longer conversations there, and when people share my videos, it tends to be on Tumblr um, and Twitter as well. Um, actually, Charlie, you, you made a good point. And just maybe show of hands, how many of you have a .com or a website that's, again, about what you do publicly that isn't one of those channels? That's good. Um, I think part of, and we talk with a lot of our clients and brands about this, is there's not all these little separate <laughs> platforms that there's a sort of fluidity to how your audiences might use them. Um, what we want to ask before I throw it open to, to our audience for questions is tell us a little bit about your viewers, your subscribers, however you think of your community, how you do react to what they may be posting and asking, and has it changed your content, or do you make some content that's specifically based on what you're getting from them? And maybe, Charlie, I'll ask you to start only because I know that um, Jack Scapp has was doing a project called the Collaboration Project, so that might be a good thing to share. Um, it's been a very turbulent year, I think it's safe to say, for Jack Scapp, uh, in that we have faced the growing up of you know the people that front it. Uh, they started off very much like a lot of people in the YouTube community doing challenge videos um, and being just very chatty and very funny and informal in front of a camera. Uh, and as soon as I know Jack hit. 2021, he decided that he wanted to take filmmaking a little bit more seriously. Um, as with, I'm sure Charlie might be able to agree, his audience hadn't quite grown up as quickly as, as he had, and it came as a shock when he introduced a lot more serious content and a bit more of a filmic vibe. Um, so it was a little bit heartbreaking and a little bit terrifying when we had a lot of negative comments saying, bring back the old fun Jack's Gap, and we're like, ah. No. Um, and we had to ignore it. Um, and I think that that's quite a brave and potentially a silly move to make. But we have benefited so much from saying, this is what we do, this is who we are, and this is what we're passionate about, um, and hoping to educate a younger audience on something that you know, is not necessarily widely available on YouTube at the moment. Um, and I also think that if an audience has been engaging with you for so long and they see that you're producing content that you're not into and it isn't necessarily your thing anymore, they're going to switch off and they're not going to engage with it. And what's so fantastic is that YouTube is organic um, and they buy into people and personalities. And as soon as you look uncomfortable, then they're not going to be, want to be a part of that anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Adam, maybe we'll skip over to you. The content that you guys produce, how much does it reflect what your, what your viewers are asking? 
or posting in question form? Um, yeah, quite a lot. I think, you know, uh, we tend to talk about a lot of Premier League teams on our channel, but there's a lot of, there's an audience in Italy and, you know, America, and they want to hear us talk about the different leagues and the different teams. So we try and factor that in uh, to our videos for the next week. And then people are suggesting different videos. We do a sort of a, a top 10 series and they're suggesting the top 10s they want to see. You know, we've had suggestions for, you know, most expensive Brazilian signings, most expensive Asian players, all this sort of stuff. So I think it's really important to make them feel part of the channel and sort of engage with them. And then the channel feels like it's theirs as well as ours, basically. Could you do a top 10 things Americans need to know about football? Uh, I could do, yeah. I mean, there's the audience suggestion right there. Do it. <laughs> Um, Etsy, I know that uh, when, when beauty and fashion are the topic, there is quite a lot of um, interest in the audience. What are some of the things that your viewers would ask you and has it reflected in the content you then produce? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to listen to them as much as possible because at the end of the day, they're the ones watching my videos. So I want them to watch something that they want to be watching. Um, so when I put a video up and they say, oh, Essie, it's too short, you know, I like your long chatty videos, I have to think, okay, they do want to see me talking about absolutely nothing. If, you know, it might not be interesting to me, but they like to hear me blabber, so, you know, I can make that happen. So, yeah, you have to listen to them, but, you know, sometimes you have to kind of take charge, and if I don't want to do something or if I don't feel comfortable doing something, I kind of just have to make that decision, but usually I listen to them. And Rosianna, what about you? It really depends. Um, I really like people who comment a lot. I really like that level of engagement. And often um, my book reviews don't get the highest views on my channel, but they get the most engagement. So when people comment saying, oh, I know these videos don't get as many views as your other videos, but I really, really love watching them, I really listen to that um, as long as I still enjoy making those videos. So it's just, just constantly checking in, like, what do you like? What do you not like? I'm not necessarily going to frame my whole channel around what they like and don't like, but it's always good to hear from your community. Um, have you reviewed a book you didn't have on your reading list because somebody suggested it? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Or often there are books. Uh, one thing I had like a couple of weeks ago was you always took a, talk about books that you love. I want to hear about some books that you absolutely hated. So that's an upcoming video, <laughs> you know, like you just, they do have good suggestions and sometimes it can be hard to come up with a video idea and yeah. there are lots of very willing people willing to share. Um, so digital technologies give us an amazing array of ways to listen. Just a show of hands, how do you guys pay attention to Google Analytics and YouTube Analytics for your channel? Uh, what other, is there another tool, a non-Google-owned tool that you use as well that's a measurement or monitoring or analytic tool? Am I starting? <laughs> um, I'm not a very analytical person. If I start thinking about numbers and turning it into that whole thing, it's just bad news for me, really. So for me, it's all about the feeling and the engagement. And if, you know, a certain video gets more likes or more comments, I, I just feel it, you know, I hate to be a hippie about it, but I just don't, I don't want to start thinking about numbers because it's going to ruin the whole creative process for me and turn it into something that isn't the reason I started. So I really don't pay attention. Uh, I pay quite a lot of attention to the, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I think for us, it's just sort of, um, we need to create stuff that's going to work really. And you, when you look at the analytics, you can see what people are responding to, what people actually want to watch and how long they're watching it for. You know, are they watching it for five minutes and they'll stop in, all that sort of stuff. So you can sort of, you look at that and you learn for the future and say, okay, next week we need to make our videos longer or shorter or whatever. So I think it's, it's, it's quite important for us personally. For me, it's, uh, it's important up to the point of like, is it, Am I getting enough views that I'm kind of sustaining my career as a YouTuber? But beyond that, I really try and pay as little attention to it as possible. In fact, I am playing with the idea at the moment, I'd really love there to be like a Chrome extension or something that would just like turn off all view counts for all videos on YouTube because I, I find that engagement is so much more important to me. I'd really much prefer to have like, you know, 10 people who really care about what I'm doing than 100 people who are kind of watching passively. Um, and I find that, you know, just the way that YouTube is set up with that big view count right at the bottom, it puts that emphasis on views when that isn't really the most, like, it, it isn't the thing that allows me to get the most out of YouTube, you know. I don't really, I wouldn't care as much about a video of mine that got millions of views 
that I kind of, you know, put together on a whim but just happened to go viral. I care much more about those videos that I've made and put a lot of passion into. Maybe don't get as many views, but have people kind of like leaving very long and thought-provoking comments and starting a proper discussion. I completely agree with Charlie. When I first started working with Jack's Gap, I made it my sole mission to crunch down on numbers and became obsessed with Google Analytics. I mean, it was the first thing I thought of in the morning was to check our stats. That's a very unhealthy attitude to have towards anything, um, but particularly when it doesn't actually mean as much as you think it does when you first look at it. Engagement is so much more important, um, and since we've done this huge change, we've also started to concentrate a lot more on that. But outside of looking at analytics, it's more now about how much of a difference we're making. So perhaps it's within a two or three month period over a series of videos, how much money we've raised for charity. That's a lot more of a, a bigger number that we're concentrating on than our view count. Yeah, I think it's also a part of how YouTube's changed over the years. So when, especially when Charlie and I started, it was such a small community and a view definitely was a higher currency. It meant a lot more. It really meant that people were sitting through your videos and you felt that maybe if they weren't commenting, it, yeah, it just meant people, really. And now it doesn't really mean people in the same way. And similarly to that, um, before we had access to Google Analytics, we used VidStats. And sometimes, as force of habit, this website VidStats, which basically mainly focuses on subscriber counts, um, I go and check it every now and then. But I do agree with these guys that focusing on it and obsessing about it um, can be really unhealthy for the creative process and also just doesn't really mean much. Great. Um, we're going to open for questions from the audience. So maybe just a quick show of hands, because I know we'll get, get some good questions in this regard. Have you worked with brands on your channel? And then we'll get deeper into maybe the hows and whys. So I'm seeing universal hands. OK. I'm going to start here. And if you just want to introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Catherine. I work on Oreo for Mondelez. Um, we've recently done a campaign with YouTube bloggers, which went really well for us. Um, obviously, it's really interesting hearing you guys talk because we work through an agent um, to get vloggers. Um, it's really interesting to hear you talk about kind of your communities and the fans. Um, and it's kind of really interesting to hear your views really of what you think of working with brands and how that kind of conflicts really with losing fans if we're too overtly branded. Um, and also whether you've got any tips for us to kind of obviously work creatively with you um, and not take away from your creativeness, but also, you know, uh, create things that are important to your communities as well. Okay, Rosianna, do you want to start off? Yeah, I mean, I think the best example, well, one of the best examples of this is, um, I can never pronounce his name properly, but Casey Neistat, Neistat. Um, he did a fantastic campaign um, where he was given $25,000 and he went to the Philippines and it was for the promotion of the uh, Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And he just went and took that money instead and after the recent typhoon, spent all that money on um, like food and resources and shelter and, and uh, helping people out. And so if, I think you just have to understand the nature of the channels you're working with. Um, you're not just kind of buying their views or buying their audience. Um, you're having like an exchange. I think you have to look at it as an exchange. You're exchanging their audience and their platform, but you're also exchanging part of their creative to part of their creative input. Um, I think it's best to go in with that really open-minded, not necessarily having to sign on the dotted line straight away, but if someone comes up to you and says, yeah, I would like to take your marketing budget that you're going to pay me to make this video and go to the Philippines with it, I think you have to be open to that. So, yeah, open-mindedness would be my biggest tip. Completely agree. I think uh, the one thing that we always look for is creative control. Um, there's nothing less beneficial, I think, for a brand and for a creator, for a brand to walk in with a very strict brief of how they want something to look and for it not to fit because as a creative, if it doesn't fit with how you want to make it, your audience is also going to hate it. And they'll look at you as a bit of a sellout, which I think then detracts from how valuable your brand looks in a video, video and the chances of them ever coming back to us. So I think it's being very, very creatively open, um, but also honest, being honest about what you're doing. Um, that I think that 
with YouTube, there are lots of potentials for people to be dishonest with branding or doing sponsorship deals. But if it's creatively allowing you to make something beautiful, then it's a fantastic equal partnership. And I think that's where it becomes a little bit more lucrative. Yeah, you, you want to be clear with your audience that what you're making is branded content because you, you don't want them to feel like um, you've cheated them at all. Um, so a big part of that is just making sure that the YouTuber you're going to actually genuinely likes the, the, the brand um, and is willing to promote it. Um, I've got a pretty good example from very recently. Sony got in touch with me. Um, they were releasing The Amazing Spider-Man 2 on, on Blu-ray. They came to me and a, a few other YouTubers um, to make videos about it. Uh, they sent us all on a trip to New York to do like a bunch of fun Spider-Man related stuff. We all made a video about it. We were already like very big Spider-Man fans, so we were, and we all enjoyed the movie, so we were very like willing to talk about it. And for us, like we got to make a video for our audience that we wouldn't have necessarily like had the idea to make or the resources to make. For me, that's what I always go into when I'm looking at brand deals. Is like, am I going to be able to make a video for the people who watch me that I wouldn't have been able to make otherwise? But it's like better. It's going to be more enjoyable uh, for them, and that worked out really well. I like saw some comments on that that were like the most positive like brand comments that I've ever, ever seen. Like people like genuinely going out of their way to say, oh my God, Sony is so great for doing this, this sort of brand deal. Um, so I think they, they were very pleased with that, but it was, yeah, creative control and all those things. Yeah, I agree with these guys are saying. I mean, I think it's about uh, creating something that's worthwhile, creating a, a great piece of content. Um, and just understanding the audience that you're trying to reach through these channels and through these creators, I think you know that's the most important thing, really. Yeah, I think the, one of the most important things is that the YouTuber understands their audience better than anyone else. I mean, for the past four years, I've been obsessed with these people, you know, and I know what's going to work. And just to give an example of how some things went terribly wrong. Um, I really liked the product, I liked the brand, I was going to work with them, and then they gave me this really strict brief on how they wanted me to do the video, and it involved me holding the product up like this for 30 seconds and not moving my arm. <laughs> so I know that that's not going to work, you know? So it's just giving the creator the creativity, I think. Um, Etsy, actually there's uh, interesting in that you doing beauty um, tutorials or vlogs or favorites. You're talking about a lot of brands that aren't necessarily you have a partnership of any way. What's the difference between the you? You're you're in that space where you're either liking or not liking, but it's not directly with that product's company. I think the beauty and fashion videos are something completely different because like you said, all we talk about is brands pretty much. Not every product I talk about is sponsored, although my audience thinks otherwise a lot of the time. Um, but you know, when I'm gonna be promoting a campaign or um, for instance, a recent video I did with Burberry where I went to the Burberry show, you know, that's obviously a very Burberry focused video. And so that's, you know, that's when it becomes something different. Um, you can, you can have an answer or not have an answer, there's no pressure, but if there was one brand that you personally would really, really want to work with, who would that be? Rosianne. Uh, can you come back to me? Sure. Uh, Canon, I think. Great. It would be a nerd Nintendo. <laughs> they, haven't, they haven't been particularly good with, with YouTube audiences generally. I feel like they're one of the brands that have trouble understanding the YouTube audience, but I love their game so much, so I, 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 I wish they would get it. Adam? Um, I think for us, so like, if you get to work with sort of sports brands, you know, Adidas, Nike, Puma, all that sort of stuff, so... Um, yeah, so... I don't really have a specific brand that I'd like to work with, but... Um, I like brands that are willing to kind of work with me, and I really like the idea of doing meetups, so where my you know, viewers or my community can come to the place and kind of set something up that's a little bit different. That's the kind of stuff I'm interested in doing in the future. Great. I would like to work with the Warner Brothers Harry Potter studio tour. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I would have said Disney. <laughs> um, question. Ross, do you have a camera? I mean, do you have a mic? Yeah. Hello. Uh, we're from IED Madrid, and uh, I want to ask you a question like, uh, what's your plan for the future to maintain the success? Because obviously the fan base that you're basing now on is going to get older. So 
you're going to get a new generation. So how are you going to talk to this new generation if already you're targeting now a specific target of audience? Um, actually, Adam, you could answer that first only because I think obviously sport, passion like football yeah. crosses age demographics. Yeah, I mean, um, since us, we, well, since I started doing this channel like a couple of years ago, I mean, it's evolved so much even since then. I mean, it was, it was so basic before, like one minute videos, you know, and we're trying to do some longer form stuff, people, stuff that really engages with the viewers, creates debate, all that sort of stuff. So I think we're already evolving. And you've just got to sort of be adaptive to the platform and trends that are happening on YouTube. So I think just keep doing that basically and do our best. Um, and Charlie, you, earlier you mentioned that Jack's Gap was pursuing more serious, more being filmmakers and actually n not, they may lose some of their younger fans. Anything to add? Um, I think what's really fantastic about YouTube is that all the videos are timeless. Um, so you're never going to have an out of date video. If there's a piece of funny content, for example, that was created a couple of years ago, a younger audience can still go back to that and enjoy it just as much as, say, their older brother did four years prior. Um, equally, YouTube is ever evolving. So, you know, young, the audience is also getting older, but it's also starting to get younger because more and more people are joining the community and starting to take an interest in it. So I don't necessarily think that that's a huge problem for creators. I can see why some people would have to be mindful of their content, but. Um, Charlie, has your, I guess, demographics, age ranges changed? Yeah, this is a, this is a hard topic for me because I've been on YouTube for so long now that I have gotten to the point where, like, the majority of my audience used to be 13 to 17 year olds, and now it's 18 to 24 year olds. And those people don't watch YouTube as much. And I know that because I've grown into that, and I don't watch YouTube as much, even though it's whole, my whole life and, and career. I don't find as much time to watch videos. So for me, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's always been a case of me wanting to make the kind of content that I would want to see, which is a way to kind of like make sure I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And that's always been very important. And I went through the same thing that, that Jack and Finn went through, very much of like wanting to update my content to reflect the person that I, I am. Um, and as a result, I had a major like audience drop off. So for me, it's become a case of like being comfortable with the idea of making content that I wouldn't necessarily want to watch, but that I think is worthwhile, that I think is good, that I enjoy making, and that I think will be important for those younger audiences. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with that. Yeah. No. Um, Rosianna, you've been doing videos for an incredibly long time, um, at a still very young age. How is your, what do you see a shift there? Uh, mine has also become primarily 18 to 24, um, but, I think that's so much a problem with me and my community, and in part because I don't have the pressure of it being my full-time job. Um, so that, yeah, that isn't as much of a concern. And I do find that whatever and whatever age anyone is, they still want to hear about someone with common experiences. I think there's um, the reasons that people started watching are still there, and I'm not, yeah, I'm not really too afraid of it yet. Essie. Yeah, I think. It's the same thing. I mean, I'm always trying to keep it fresh and try to think of interesting ideas and, you know, how to keep people engaged with everything. Um, but I think you can't, it's the kind of thing you just have to grow with it and see how it goes kind of thing. That's how I, you know, that's how I'm going with it anyway. Yeah. Um, one or two more quick questions. There's one right in front. Hi. Um, just wanted to ask, some of you are doing it as a career and some of you are doing it more as um, a hobby or as a part-time job. Um, does that affect the way you approach uh, trying to increase your number of viewers or the increase the number of people in your community? Do you actively go out to try and engage more people in your videos and how would you go about doing that? Okay, well, in some ways, I think, Rosianna, your channel's not your full-time job, but in some ways, video, YouTube, that universe is your full-time job. So, uh, so my full, well, full-ish time job, um, I work for John Green, who wrote The Fault in Our Stars, which did very well this summer. Um, he also runs an online video production company, and they produce online video um, such as a series Crash Course and Mental Floss and SciShow, um, et cetera. And that very much, you know, we, we try and find new audiences with that, whether that's through um, the kind of old media route of, of pushing it through Mental Floss, but then also doing very new things. Mental Floss is um, 
a popular trivia magazine in the States. Um, or I think we still have a lot of faith in the existing community. We don't have a marketing budget. We just have people who know social media because they grew up with it. And I mean, for now, it's working. I don't know whether it will stop working when we maybe have fewer people who are as familiar with the platforms being used and as more platforms are introduced. But for now, it's just kind of swimming along very nicely. Anybody, anybody else want to take a crack at that? Yeah, um, I think that we've never actively fished out an audience. We've never thought, oh, we're getting a bit of a drop at the moment. We should start trying to recruit an audience. Um, it's never been that way. But if it's getting to a case where a lot of what we do tries to be a little bit more high production value due to travel, um, if we're thinking that we're not getting enough views to make enough money to produce it, that's, I think, when we look to brands to see who we can partner with to make uh, new, exciting content possible, as opposed to, you know, worrying about trying to get in a new audience when the one that we've got at the moment is already so great. Adam, did you have something there? Um, yeah, because it's my full-time job, I have a boss, and he is big on numbers, so... <laughs> I think it's about balancing, I'm trying to do stuff that I like creating and also trying to do stuff that's going to get big views. So we are always trying to chase numbers and subscribers, but I think you've got to do it in a way that, um, in a way that's organic. So we do a lot of collaborations with other channels, trying to grow our audience. Um, as I said, sort of looking at the analytics, what videos are working, where the views are coming from, and just sort of trying to, trying to keep my boss off my back a little bit, as well as sort of uh, making videos that I like, so yeah. Um, that's a huge, that's, that's a great point in terms of collaboration. I would say one of the giant differences between YouTube creators and a lot of the brands is collaboration is natural. We've seen it in the blogging world. They come together, they do stuff together. Very rare for brands to do stuff um, in that collaborative way, especially if they're not from the same corporate family. So Jeremy, you had a question. So you've all grown up in this new social media world. What do you aspire to be doing in five years' time? For example, Adam, uh, do you see yourself, do you aspire to become the uh, football writer of the Sun or the Times, or is that the opposite to what you want to do? So just be interested where you think you'll, you'll go in five years. That's a great question we're going to end on, is your future. <laughs> what do you um, want to do with your life? Yeah, <laughs> big question. Um, <laughs> It's hard. I, I think it's difficult for me. I think um, so. I have. There's been a couple of sort of big uh, news companies and like sports companies that have wanted me to work for them, sort of thing. But the problem was I wouldn't have been able to express my creativity as much. So where I am at the moment, I'm very lucky. I get to basically do whatever videos I want. Although I'm chasing the numbers for my boss, I can do whatever I want, sort of thing. So at the moment, I'm just sort of reluctant to go to the sun or whatever, you know, all that sort of stuff. And I think it's just. I just at the moment, I just want to create good videos and keep learning. So at the moment, I'm always learning new things about YouTube, about our audience, about you know online media. So uh, yeah, just see where that takes me. Um, Se, any thoughts on where you'll be in five years? Um, I get this question a lot, and a lot of people say, "Oh, you must want to be a TV presenter. You must want to be a makeup artist." Actually, no, that's the complete opposite of what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to. You know, I don't really have a clear path set out, but I'm just trying to build my own sort of brand and be able to continue my creativity. And if I could stay on YouTube for the rest of my life, that would be great. Um, but just seeing what happens, really. But I'm not, I'm not really trying to become anything else. Rosianne, in five years? I mean, the thing is, we've been so spoiled in that we can do so many different things. We didn't have to get a production team to make our very first YouTube videos. So I, I love doing so many different things. I'd like to be... Uh, published and highly successful author. I'd like to be CEO of the production company I currently work for with John. And I'd like to keep working with the people I'm working with and keep working online video because I do think it's a great space. Charlie? I think what's really exciting is I left school when I was 16 and was very sure that I was going to be a writer um, and suddenly met two boys that very much changed my life and my opinion on career paths. Um, six months prior to meeting them, I don't think the job that I do now existed, which makes me very excited for the five years ahead of us, because I'm sure in a year's time there will be jobs that I'll be so well equipped to do because of the background knowledge I have now that don't exist yet and we don't know of. And I think particularly being so native to you know the digital age, it would almost be a bit naive and stupid to say in five years this is where I want to be. And I think a lot of people of an older generation expect us to be 
trying to prove ourselves on this new media to sink back into old school media. Um, I produce a YouTube channel, but I don't think I'd like to produce TV shows, if that makes sense. Um, and Charlie will end. What do you think? Well, I feel like um, I don't feel like I've ever really had like a passion to make YouTube videos and have that be my job at all. I mean, I said at the beginning, nobody had that as a, their job initially. For me, it's always just like YouTube is just my tool to do to make whatever I want to make. More recently, I, I just sort of like decided, kind of almost at random, that I wanted to get into doing narrative filmmaking. So for the last year or so, my channel has been me doing my video blogs as per normal, and then every now and then just posting just like a short film. And so I have ambitions to you know uh, write and direct features and web series and all that sort of stuff. But um, I kind of know instinctively that the internet is just going to play a, a part of that because. It just it just has to for me just just makes makes sense but it's like it for me it's just like that's just the tool to meet the end which is just to be creating stuff just to be making art wonderful thank you all so very much